I see the number increasing by the moment. So I know that this is a topic a lot of people are really interested in, and I'm excited to share some information that will hopefully be very informative and helpful for you as you map out uh, your executive MBA journey. Um, and a big piece of that, of course, is financing the program. Um, so we're looking forward to answering your questions today and hopefully sharing some insights um, that will, will benefit you in your preparation and research. Just give it one more moment in case we have any others uh, joining. Okay, well, it's two minutes after the hour and I know your time is very valuable. So let's, uh, let's get started. Um, I thought we could start with an introduction um, to the, the panelists today, um, including uh, a money expert. Christine, maybe I'll hand the baton to you first to, to introduce yourself if you don't mind and we can go through the, the slide of who's speaking today. Sure, I was a, a, a full-time MBA grad of Ivy in MBA 2010. After that, I pivoted from engineering in the oil and gas industry, and I ended up in capital markets. So I worked for a year on the trading floor at RBC. Then I spent time being a stock analyst covering oil and gas stocks in London, UK. And then I came back to Canada and helped build and sell a mutual fund. And now I am a startup founder helping women with their money at a, an affordable price um, at a company called Untangle Money. So really like money. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Christine. You're the you're a, a great person to have at this event because I think you know the the ins and outs in a way that um, everyone will benefit extensively from. So thanks so much for making the time to join us join us today. JD, why don't I hand it over to you from here? Yeah. So my name is uh, JD Clark, and I'm the executive director of admissions and recruitment for the master's programs at Ivy. One of those programs being the uh, executive MBA. I'm also an executive MBA graduate uh, as well. So I did the um, I did the program. So it's uh, and I've been involved with the executive MBA program for Ivy about 17, 18 years now. So happy to be uh, participating uh, in this webinar. Thank you for the opportunity, Kim. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time and expertise. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm next, I guess. My name is Kim Randall. Um, it's always funny looking back at your reflection because I can see my picture on the screen here. Um, but I know that if uh, you are exploring the Executive MBA, which of course you are, that's why you're attending this event today, I really look forward to being a key contact of yours at Ivy. I work as the Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment, specifically with the Executive MBA program. Um, so you can think of me as kind of your your, your right hand through the process. My job is to help you. My job is to answer your questions, um, to support your research into the program, what sets Ivy apart, and hopefully provide you with the information that you need to determine if the Ivy Executive MBA is going to be the right fit. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing information with you today about financing your Executive MBA. And I strongly encourage each of you to reach out to me after this presentation. If you'd like to continue the conversation, not just about financing the program, but whether it's connecting with an alum, whether it's uh, joining us for a class visit, understanding the nitty gritty of the program and what sets us apart, it would be an absolute pleasure to connect with each of you. Um, so please don't be shy, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what I'm here for. So without further ado, I thought we could start with a very brief overview of the program. So a high level um, run through of the Executive MBA. And I'll start by just sharing, as you may already know, it's a 15 month while you work program. So it is designed for busy professionals like yourselves um, who are looking to, to juggle um, and successfully manage the time commitment of the program in addition to your busy, busy careers. So you are not asked to leave the workforce to complete the program. That's one of the differentiators from a full-time MBA. Um, you are going to be coming together though once a month in person in downtown Toronto at our Donald K. Johnson facility in the Exchange Tower. You'll see on the screen here that our program has two intakes per year. So every September and every February, we welcome um, a cohort of participants joining the program. So a lot of flexibility in terms of when you begin. And as I mentioned, it's taught predominantly in downtown Toronto. Um, we do offer what are called rolling offers of admissions. So what's that, what that means is that when you apply, you can expect to get the ball rolling quite uh, right away. 
And we, in many instances, can issue a decision within, within a couple of weeks of you submitting your application. So if you are a super planner and you want to know well in advance, you can apply as soon as an application opens. To give you a sense, we are already accepting applications for our February start date. Um, so you can apply at any time and typically have a decision within a couple of weeks of submitting that application. The next bullet here says it case-based. And what does that mean? That's a real differentiator at Ivy. We are one of only four business schools around the world and the only business school in Canada that teaches through the case-based approach. What that means is that you will be studying business cases or business problems as you prepare for each class. And every time you come together with your peer group, you're put in the driver's seat to solve the problem, to drive decision. And throughout the course of the program, as you're completing over 220 cases, you are really getting an opportunity to hear different perspectives of how your colleagues and professionals from a variety of industries solve problems. You are put in the position to consider an abundance of information and variables to determine how you would drive the decision for the organization at hand. And that practice, that dress rehearsal, it's very much like a flight simulator. And it really rounds out individuals' knowledge to have a tremendous impact within their organizations. And so when you think about the executive MBA, you can think of it as really broadening out your knowledge to drive impact and to have um, make very meaningful and substantial contributions across all business lines within your organization. And the case-based method really lends itself to that. And last but not least, um, I of course have to acknowledge that the uh, diversity of experience in each cohort is top notch. We truly pride ourselves on bringing together very successful, um, experienced managers, leaders from a variety of industries to uh, contribute to the class, uh, class environment. So because we are a case-based school, it's incredibly participatory and you benefit greatly from sitting in a classroom with individuals who work across healthcare, government, education, financial institutions, manufacturing, operations, you name it the diversity of industries represented in the class really lends itself to a unique learning environment and it, uh, it truly is world-class. So that's a little bit of an overview about the program. I thought it might be helpful to actually, um, I'm very visual, so if you're anything like me, you can see the program calendar here. This is an example of a program calendar for participants who are joining in September um, in a few months from now. And you'll see it's color coded accordingly to demonstrate when you would be in London for residency weeks, which are highlighted at the beginning of term one and at the beginning of term three. You'll also see that there are four days per month color coded when you are in downtown Toronto for your in person modules. And then you'll also see that we have international opportunities built into the degree, um, including for our September cohort. Um, a trip to Silicon Valley in term two, which focuses on entrepreneurship and sustainability. And the final trip of the program in term three, our discovery expedition, um, which typically visits an emerging economy. We are uh, looking forward to returning to both Brazil and Vietnam in the, in the, coming, um, in the coming months. And so really this is, uh, this is a snapshot of what that experience would look like for you and the, the in-person time commitment. Now, I should also note that there are many weeks when you're not actually in class. Um, those weeks are still quite busy and on average participants spend 25 hours a week reviewing the cases, preparing their notes, meeting with their learning teams and working on, on individual assignments and group projects. So it, it is an incredibly uh, robust um, time commitment, but it is very manageable. And I would be very happy to talk with each of you after if you are wondering how to find the time or to connect you with someone who's been through the program to learn firsthand from their experience. So that's a high level overview of the uh, of the time commitment. I'm just going to open the, the chat here. Um, and and I see that there's a question about it being recorded. Absolutely. Um, and I will open the questions. If you don't mind, we'll maybe just save the questions until until the end. Um, because I, I have a high degree, I'll still JD's term, but it's true for me too, a high degree of distractibility. So if I zip in, in and out of the chat, um, I'll probably lose my train of thought and that'll not be a, a good thing for anybody. So I'll stick to it um, and look forward to answering all of your 
questions after. So I just talked about the time commitment of the program, and we certainly recognize and it, it's an incredible investment of your time. It's also an enormous investment in your future. And a big part of that is understanding the cost of the program, how to make it work from a financial perspective. And that's what we're hoping to address head on today and, and look forward to answering your questions and sharing insights related to the, the financial component. So what I've demonstrated on the slide here is the program fee and the payment schedule. So the Ivy Executive MBA program is an all-inclusive cost of 117,000 Canadian dollars. I'm often asked the question, is it different for Canadian citizens versus permanent residents? And the answer is no, this is the, this is the total program fee. Uh, next, you'll see the payment schedule, which I think is important to highlight because there's often um, uncertainty about how, how the, that amount is distributed across the course of the program. So ultimately, if you apply to the program and receive an offer of admission, the onus is then on you to accept that offer and pay the deposit of $2,000. That is a non-refundable deposit and that secures your place in the program. This is important as it's a, it is a very highly sought after program. We often find ourselves in the situation of a wait list and it's important for us to know that you are, you're, you're coming. You are joining us in either September or February and that $2,000 deposit confirms your spot. From there, we, um, we will ask for a term one payment of $37,000 due at the beginning of term one. And then there are subsequent payments due at the beginning of term two and term three, equaling the total program fee. Now I'm often asked, what does that include? Do I have to pay for textbooks outside of that? What about career coaching? And I'm happy to reiterate that it really is an all-inclusive fee. So the program uh, fee, what you'll see on the screen here are some of the things that it includes, all of the things that it includes. And I mentioned the residency weeks on the calendar earlier, that residency week at the beginning of term one and term three, all of your accommodation and your meals, they are, are provided. You'll stay at our beautiful Spencer Leadership Center, which is an incredible hotel like conference uh, center in London. Um, so that is included. All of your meals, um, chef prepared, if you will, um, during your Toronto sessions. Um, you will eat very well. You'll never be hungry. We recognize that food is fuel. And so you'll eat very well throughout the program. Um, all of your learning materials, the textbooks, the case-based material, that is all shared with you um, well before the program begins. So you can uh, really jump in with both feet. That's all included, as well as career workshops and executive career coaching sessions. The executive MBA is really designed to accelerate your career in your function or in your industry. And we want to equip you with all of the tools possible to be successful in that space. And so we work with exceptional executive career coaches who are very well versed with working to mid to senior level managers in the most senior leadership positions uh, to help you achieve that next step or to be more most successful and effective in your current role. So that's something you can look forward to. Um, the other thing I'll mention is the dual occupancy accommodation during those international trips. So the only cost that is not included in that $117,000 are your flights to the international destinations. And that is, I think, to your benefit because it gives you flexibility to book, um, book the flights that work for you in terms of arriving early. If you have family in, um, if you have family in Brazil, for example, you might want to extend your trip. If you've always wanted to travel to South America, and want to add on a little bit of time, you're not um, confined to a group travel trip. And this allows participants from all across Canada to fly from their home city. Um, so that's the only cost that's not included, but otherwise it is truly an all-inclusive cost. So that's a little bit about the, um, the cost of the program and what it includes. And what I'll, what I'll touch on now, or what I'll do is hand the baton over to JD who's going to talk about corporate sponsorship, which is something we are asked about a lot. And hopefully this will help both shed some light, um, maybe offer some uh, myth busting. Um, and I'll hand it over to JD to talk about sponsorship um, in case it's an option available to you to help offset the cost of the program. Yeah, so thanks so much, Kim. Uh, the first thing I wanna kind of give you is some stats uh, on given classes about you know, the numbers that are sponsored versus those that pay for it themselves. So 
typically in every given class, about 50% of the participants are self-funded. That means that they fund 100% of the program themselves. And uh, Christine's going to talk a lot about some of those tools if you're funding the program either fully yourself or uh, partially and some of those things for you to consider. Approximately 50% of our participants receive partial or full funding. So just to give you a sense, about 20% will receive full funding uh, and about 30% receive partial funding. Now that partial funding could be anything from, you know, uh, uh, you know, half of it, or it could be anything that's really, you know, we have a training allowance of $2,000 a year. But that just gives you a sense of what that breakdown is. When people are self-funded, when, oh, sorry, when their people are funded by their organizations fully, one of the things that you see is that they sign a retention agreement. So that is very, very common when an organization is fully funded, and we see some retention agreements even with partial funding as well. So a typical retention agreement that we see is a range of two to five years after graduation. The average that I see in more general basis is a three-year retention agreement. So you agree to stay with the company for three years after you have completed the program is generally what we see. And it is very common if you are approached by organizations too is that it scales down. So something like to the effect of, you know, if you leave after year one, you, you know, you pay 100, 000, you know, 100%, and then year two it would be like 50, and then maybe year three, 25%. So I always counsel people when they look at retention agreements is there should be some sort of scale down process that is there. Um, we do have a lot of resources that are available to help guide the conversation with your employer. And I'll be more specific about that. We have a brochure that has been written specifically for the corporate corporation. So last for the candidate considering, this is more for the company talking about the benefits of sponsoring somebody to do it. The one way that you can give back to your organization on it is you have the opportunity to work on course projects based on problems that your organization is going through. I have seen over the years, a couple of situations where people have, you know, people go into the program, not receiving any sponsorship. And when they start working on projects in their organization, and start applying their learning within the organizations. I've seen that uh, you know, people have been able to gain sponsorship once the organization sees some value in there. So we have some templates around business cases that we can provide you. We also have that brochure that we can provide you uh, as well. I would say I'm gonna give you one tip before we move on to the next slide. When you think about you know, going for corporate sponsorship, you always have to link it to a development plan not as much of a retention. Sometimes what will happen is an organization will use this because they want to retain the employee. But the problem is when you're done this program and if you're in the same role, you're going to be unhappy. I remember somebody once said who was in that situation where they finished the program, they're ready for the next step, but they were like, but you so, do so good in the role. One of the reasons we sponsored you is because we want you in that role. You're a key player, but I want to try something else. And he said he felt like he was being shoved back in his two by two box after doing this program for two years. So I really, really think a key tip is, as you're talking to your organization, is make sure you talk to them about it from a aspect of how this can fit in a development plan where you can grow within the organization. And so, you know, the retention part is important, but you also want to make sure that you have opportunities to grow and use the learning in the organization and take on more senior roles uh, when it's done. So that's just a little bit of tips in, in corporate sponsorship. And again, if you want any of the tools and, and some of the resources that we have, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Thanks, JD. Um, yes, and so please do follow up. I'm happy to share those uh, share those with you. Um, next, I'd like to touch on scholarships, um, acknowledging that this is definitely a, a question I'm certainly asked a lot about um, in terms of what scholarships are available. I'm pleased to share that we offer three unique entrance scholarships. They're outlined on our, our website in further detail, and I'll address them here as well. We offer entrance scholarships for individuals who self-identify as Black learners. We also offer entrance scholarships for individuals who identify as Indigenous learners. And last but not least, we offer an application-based scholarship for participants who work in the not-for-profit sector. 
These are $10,000 entrance awards and they are, um, a, they are applied to term one, uh, your term one tuition. And if you have questions or are interested to learn more about these scholarships, I would be very pleased to speak with you about them. Um, but in terms of addressing the question of what scholarships do you have available, these are the three uh, that you may be eligible for um, and that we have on offer. Next, I want to talk a little bit about bursaries um, and the fact that we offer both travel and accommodation bursaries for individuals who are joining the program from outside of the GTA. And to give you a sense, typically about 15% of participants join the program from outside of Ontario, meaning that they're, they're flying in each month, um, whether it's from Halifax or Vancouver, um, to participate in the, in the Toronto-based modules and all of the in-person learning. Um, and we also see very strong participation from folks outside of the GTA, whether that's Northern Ontario, um, Ottawa, Windsor, you name it. We recognize that participating in the program uh, from outside of the GTA does come with an additional expense in terms of both your travel and accommodation. So we have developed bursaries to help you offset those costs. The, the first is related to accommodation. So anyone joining the program and your home address is more than 100 kilometers from, um, from our facility in downtown Toronto, you will be eligible for an accommodation bursary. This is an amount, uh, you'll be eligible for $1,500 per term. Um, so how this works is that you, it works out to about $100 uh, per night. And so whether you're staying in a hotel or many participants rent an Airbnb with their classmates, um, you'll find what works best for you. But ultimately you will submit your receipts at the end of the term and you will be reimbursed up to $1,500 per term um, over the course of the program. So that's our accommodation bursary. And secondly, I'll touch on our, our travel bursary. Uh, if you're visiting, um, not visiting, if you're coming to Toronto um, for the program from more than 400 kilometers outside of the facility, you will also be eligible for um, reimbursement up to certain amount. So if you are from outside of 400 kilometers, you'll be eligible for $1,200 per term. If you are coming to the program from Quebec, you'll be eligible for $1,700 per term. And if you're from out west of the Ontario border or the Atlantic provinces, you'll be eligible for $2,500 per term. And what you'll find if you are visiting uh, or exploring the program from out of province, um, you'll find on our website, we have an alumni panel that's been recorded and shared called The Commute. And it shares the stories and experiences of participants who flew in each month for the program. And I, I can recall um, some sentiment shared by folks from um, Calgary and from Victoria who said that the travel bursary more than covered the cost of their flights. Um, it's smart to book in advance um, and they shared a number of tips and tricks. So be sure to listen into that if, um, if this applies to you and you'll be looking to join from out of the, pro out of the province. Um, so that's a little bit about the travel and accommodation bursaries. Like I said, you'll share your receipts um, at the end of each term and be reimbursed up to the um, allow the permissible amount. With that, I'm going to ha hand it over to Christine, who's going to talk about the RSP Lifelong Learning Program. Great, thanks, Kim. So, an option to help offset the costs of any schooling that you do in Canada is using your RSP savings if you have them. You can use a program called the Lifelong Learning Program, which is that you can take $10,000 out of your RSP each year, each tax year, to put towards your education. Now you can't just pull it out. You need to use um, the, oh, I had it, the RC, I can't remember, RC96 form. So I'm gonna put that in the chat, um, just the link to it. Um, in case you want to look at it, make sure you use this form, take it to your institution and withdraw the funds using this. That deems these funds as being used for educational purposes and then you need to, you have to pay it back over 10 years. I am fairly certain it's done usually evenly over 10 years, um, but because that's the only way I've ever seen it done, but it may be that you have any time within those 10 years to do it. Um, and then, and you know, as an RSP is a tax uh, sheltered account here in Canada, you have to be Canadian to use this one, unfortunately. 
Are there any questions about that? I don't see any questions in the chat okay. about RSV. I can move on to the next slide if you like. Sure. So this is one of the big changes since I went through the program is that um, most of the provinces and the federal government have removed most of the tuition benefits that you can claim on your tax returns. And it does unfortunately make the MBA or the EMBA more expensive, but it is very important that you, you will get a T2202 from the school. You need to put this into your taxes and you will get 15% of any eligible tuition funds back in a credit. It's always just great to make sure you're taking advantage of any way that you can lower the cost. This is one of the biggest things as a financial planner. The costs are so much easier to control um, and have you know, uh, visibility on than revenues or your income. You can't really predict what your income is going to be. You, could, you have great hopes and you know it's a great step having an EMBA to increase your income, but you can really manage those costs. So use this credit. Um, also, if you're using a Canadian loan program, then you can also use, uh, you can also deduct the interest on that student loan in your taxes as well. Um, does that, anybody have any questions about the 2202? I can put a, this is what it is. There is a question going back oh, yes. to the T2 form, but there's um, a question about the RSP lifelong learning program. Um, and if it's uh, $10,000 per year um, or yes. $10,000 one-time um, opportunity. My understanding is that it's $10,000 per year. That's so, correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, you, can, you can dip into it each year. It's unfortunate it's only $10,000. I know that doesn't cover the cost. That may not be the worst thing with markets being down if you're withdrawing funds at this time. So um the two yes so the school is going to give you the t2202 it comes from the institution that you are attending it's partially because you pay a, a, a fee and I, I believe it's that not all of the fees that you pay are eligible tuition expenses and so they clarify for the government what fees are eligible based on all the nuts and bolts and they give you that form and you use that form and you claim 15% of it on your, on, and I'll put it in the chat just so you know what you're gonna be receiving. This is- Looking well, at a little bit like. more to that is- Awesome. The, the, um, so over, so you get the T2202 on the calendar year. So it's the, two, it's the, what you've paid within that calendar year, the T2202A. Um, but for the life of the program, um, you know, the cost being 117,000, generally the tuition portion is between 90 and 95,000. So what's not included in the tuition portion is the international trip. The, uh, what else is included in it? You know, the non-tuition portion is books and materials and any other facilities costs. So that's the, the larger part. So over the life of the program, so if you take, you know, 15% of 90 to 95,000, it would be in that uh, area there. So, yeah. And you claim and, it as there's, when you file tax, I just did, my daughter just went to college. So of course we claimed the tuition tax credit. So it's pretty straightforward. You yes. get the form from the institution. It goes right into the tax deductible portion. If you're using software or give it to an accountant. So. I highly recommend using a software like Intuit. They, they're very clever. They will, yeah. um, I made some notes here. They will remind you about things like childcare. You can deduct childcare for education. Um, again, there are some moving fees that you can deduct if you're moving in the direction of the school. So even if it's not for school, they are, there are some little ways that you can um, increase your deductions. And I find Intuit or these tax calculators are really, really good at prompting you um, to make sure you're grabbing every little piece and they're up to date. So I think uh, it's worth the money um, to, to make sure you're capturing these things. And then there's a question in the question, $10,000 per year, if the program is 15 months, wouldn't that apply for two years and $20,000? That's correct. 
yes, if it runs over the course of a calendar year, um, so 15 months would, then you are able to dip in twice. But on the last side, you'll notice that it, it depends on when March happens in that year. Um, and so you need to be careful, uh, just make sure you're lining up the tax years with the school years properly. Um, and I believe the financial institution is able to help you with that. Where you house your RSP, they can, they can help make sure you're doing it properly. Um, 20,000 in total, what is the max? Did that answer Ruby's question around the T2202? There was it. a question related to the T22 in terms of um, where do you claim it? But yes, you claim it with your taxes. And yes. You annual taxes. That's on um, your, yes, on you your personal to. taxes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. You can also you can also carry over some amount if you've maximized your uh, your claim, you know, your your tax deductions that year, there's also the opportunity to carry over the T2202A if you'd like to carry it over to a subsequent year. Yeah, which is helpful because sometimes the year afterwards, just the way, you know, I started in September. Um, so I only worked four months of that tax year. So it, I used it the following year on the first full year because that's when my taxes were higher. And that's a really good thing to keep in mind as well. Thank you. Um, I saw a question related to scholarships pop up. I'll touch on it, um, I'll respond to that and then we'll move into the next slide looking at the preferred bank loans um, that are available to IV participants. Um, a scholarship, are, are there scholarships geared towards women participants? How about Forte scholarships? Great question. Um, the scholarships that I noted in the previous slide related to um, are available to black learners, indigenous learners and participants who work in the not-for-profit sector. Those are the three different scholarships that we have available. Um, unfortunately, the Forte scholarship, um, it's not available to executive MBA participants, though um, Ivy does have a, um, there are opportunities for full-time MBA participants um, to look into Forte. But that unfortunately, as I said, is not available to executive MBA participants. One thing I do want to note on that, though, is Forte does have a lot of resources in general. They will help you with your application. They will help you with some mentorship. Um, and I would strongly recommend that you at least check them out. Um, I've had quite a few people speak very highly to me about that uh, organization, specifically in, in helping um, with the application. And often there, there are maybe entrance scholarships as well, is that is that right? Uh, based on application strength, or is that just in the MBA? It would not be not for the executive MBA. The scholarships okay. available are exclusively the just those three. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, let's move along. Um, and if your question wasn't answered now, we we will have time at the end to continue answering questions. So please don't worry if we didn't touch on it just now, but maybe, um, Christine, I'll, um, I'll, I know you have the, you have the mic here. Yes. So this, this was really important, uh, specifically in my experience, Ivy has relationships with specific people at these banks. Um, and I highly, highly, highly recommend that you, if you are looking at taking a bank loan, a student loan from one of these organizations that you reach out to that person who is specifically involved. They understand the specific terms that have been set out way better than, and I know you might have a really strong personal relationship with the person who you have at your bank. Um, this is just one of those times when it's not a program that's going to be well known with inside the bank branch network. So they really highlighted specific people who have experience with these loans, who understand the terms and conditions and are going to be able to give you the best rates um, and um, and sort of payback periods. I noticed some of them have two year uh, sort of, uh, you know, you don't have to pay it back for a two year period. And oh, yeah, two year grace, it's right up on there. Um, and, you know, that is really important. It can be so easy to go into your EMBA very excited about the future and and not realize that just like any other school event it takes a while to get back on your feet sometimes um 
because you may have switched jobs, because you may be in a new industry, because you may have been inspired to go in a different direction. And it's always great to have that option. And these are the people that would be listed when you, did you want to put that in the chat, Kim, literally, or do you want me to do it? Um, on Ivy's website, I highly recommend you make sure you reach out to those individuals. Uh, I didn't on the first go round, and I ended up having to um, connect with that person in the end anyway, so it would, it'll save you time. <laughs> Don't do what I did, cautionary tale. Um, so what, just to clarify what Christine's referring to on the, on the oh, Ivy so Executive MBA site, on the finance page, um, I'm reluctant to exit the screen um, because it's recording the actual actual screen. Um, but I'll put I, it in what, the chat. Please. You drop it in the chat and each of the banks listed here these are specific rates that have been established and loan programs that have been um, developed for Negotiate. IV participants. And what you'll see in the link is that there are very specific contacts, there are direct numbers uh, for you to reach out to, to explore what's available to you um, and how this would work in your situation. So you're strongly encouraged to reach out to the specific contact listed. Thank you. Great. Um, what I'd like to touch on here are some of the, the ways that we know that you're making a big investment in yourself, your time, your finances. Um, and we want, I would hopefully what I'll do here is articulate that we're also very invested in your success. Um, I, I often think, um, you know, my role in recruitment and admissions is to work with people to join the program. But I think, I feel like I have a very serious responsibility to recruit for retention. So we're not in the business of just inviting you into the program and saying, good luck. Um, we're very much um, invested in your success, supporting you through the program and through the, through the process. And there's a number of ways that we do this. Um, one is that you're assigned a program manager um, when you join the program. This is like, a, I'll say a personal concierge, but you're sharing the program manager with your, with your peers. But there's a very seamless handoff um, after we have the opportunity to work together through the admission process. You'll then be connected to the program manager who is there to support you and all of the administrative details, any challenges that you face in the program, they are there to make sure that those worries are alleviated and that you can focus on the learning. That is the key, that is our priority. And we do everything possible to ensure that um, any obstacles that are in your way um, related to the, the program, hopefully there won't be any, but if anything was to come up, um, we will work very diligently to ensure that you're back to your learning um, and that that's the focus. We also recognize um, that your participation in the program, it has an impact on the, uh, the people in your life. And so I often laugh, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a baby. Um, I often think it takes a village to support someone through an executive MBA. And so one of the ways that we really um, work with you to help your network and your village um, if you have a partner, they are really encouraged um, to get to know what you're going through and the experience that you're part of. During that initial residency week in London, your partner is invited to join you for the second part of that, uh, that the experience to participate in a, a dinner, to meet your peers, to meet their partners. Um, and they're also invited to join an actual class. They'll sit in on their own case. They'll be provided with the materials in advance. Um, and it is an opportunity for um, your partner to really meaningfully engage in, in the experience that you're part of because it really is a, a family affair. Um, a word of warning though, I've been hearing from a lot of spouses lately who say, I have seen the transformation that's, that's taken place with my partner and I wanna do the program too. So uh, that's my, my word of caution is that uh, your, um, your partner might be looking to join the executive MBA themselves after joining the weekend. Um, I touched a little bit earlier on the executive career coaching and the supports available uh, with career management. Um, they truly are top notch. They're personalized and tailored. You're going to get a lot out of it. Um, and those, uh, those sessions are of tremendous value as you um, really think about how you're going to um, use the experience and, that you've gained from the program, even in the middle of the program to accelerate and to continue to propel yourself forward. The next thing is the ongoing contact with faculty. Um, what you'll find is that our, our faculty are incredibly invested in your success. 
They don't have office hours because you'll call them. They truly take on the role of mentor um, and are there to, um, to really understand uh, pain points, to understand challenges, but also to celebrate the success that you're having in the program um, and in your, in your career. Uh, so that's something you can really look forward to. Our faculty are world-class. They are, um, many bring extensive industry experience to the classroom. I think it's important to note that they're very experienced at teaching and educating experienced managers. So this is uh, not their, their first experience in front of uh, a, a number of executives. In fact, many teach in our Ivy Academy, which is um, a branch at Ivy that is geared towards executive education. They're tremendous and they're there to support you. And then my last note here, speaking of support, the Ivy Alumni Network is 30,000 strong. It is global. And actually just last month, we celebrated our annual Global Ivy Day where chapters all around the world were heavily, um, heavily involved in celebrating their connection to Ivy, the growth that has, has um, happened as a result of their experience with Ivy. And actually I met Christine through, um, through the Ivy Alumni Network because Christine's heavily involved with Women of Ivy in the Toronto Alumni Chapter. Um, and we collaborated on an event earlier this year. Um, what you'll find is that there are um, different pockets um, around the world of Ivy alumni who are always willing to pick up the phone, excited to share their, their insights, their advice, their network. And there are a lot of events and opportunities to get to know them um, uh, happening year round. So that's something I think you can look forward to. And I think it a, a speaks to the investment that we make in your success as well. Next, I'm gonna hand it back to JD. Um, this is of course a really big um, question is the ROI. You know, there's so many wonderful things I can tell you about the professional and personal growth that results from the program. Um, but I'm sure you're attending this financing your executive MBA session. You wanna understand more about the hard numbers. And so I'll pass it over to JD, who's going to talk a bit about uh, the nitty gritty of the ROI and some reporting that's been done by the Financial Times. Yeah, so thanks, Kim. So yeah, as Kim mentioned, we get this question a lot. And so this is probably the best data point to look at it. And then I'll provide a little bit of caution when you look at this as well. So what happens is the Financial Times does a ranking each year of executive MBA programs. And they go out and they survey individuals that were completed the program three years previously. So they graduated three years previously. And they ask them about their salary increase after they completed the executive MBA. So what we generally see is we see around that 60% range of a salary increase. So when I finish the program versus where I'm at, uh, you know, at the uh, three year mark after that point of graduating from the program. So we see generally around that 60% mark. This comes in at the highest point in Canada. So generally other executive MP, you see about 50%, 53, mid fifties. Um, I will throw caution to this because uh, there are some individuals and I'm going to give some examples that may do this to actually take a cut and pay. So, you know, the problem with looking at averages and you will learn this when you take the uh, executive MBA program and take the decision with analytics course, one of the first ones you do is that averages can be some flawed in some ways. So some people will take a drop in pay and, and that is deliberate on their part. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Sometimes we have individuals that come in in a sales executive role where they're highly commissioned and doing well, but they're actually using this to transition out of sales to take more leadership roles. Those more leadership roles, because they're not tied to commission anymore, may take a drop in salary. Another example that we see is physicians. So we always get physicians in the class that wanna cut back on the clinical side, take more of a leadership position within hospitals. And again, they are highly paid well on the clinical side, and they may actually make less by taking a leadership position. So again, it depends on an individual's sort of motive for taking the program, but this just provides you a little bit of statistics around you know, the financial ROI that, that people see on average, but also keeping in mind that it is an average. Thanks, JD. Um, I thought it might be interesting. I, I pulled this from a recent, um, a blog post, an article that one of our participants who joined the program in February recently wrote, if you've been on our 
on our website um, and read uh, the blog on the news news stories. Um, it's Patrick Lowe, who's in term one of the program right now, shared some insights about um, his first 60 days in the program. I strongly encourage everyone to read it um, if you have the time. Um, but what he did after, at the end of it, he wrapped it up by kind of polling a few of his classmates to say, what are you getting from the program in the first 60 days? What, are, what have you gained? And I think this really speaks to um, speaks to the growth that happens both professionally and personally immediately. Um, so I think that's one of the real benefits of the degree is that you don't have to wait 15 months for the, um, for the piece of paper to say you've successfully earned your executive MBA for it to start bringing tremendous value to you in your career and in your life. Um, the ROI is immediate. I remember actually in February, sitting at a lunch table in London, the class on day two um, broke for a meal and I joined them for lunch. And I sat there with um, a participant who's from the GTA who said, oh my gosh, I can't, like they had just come from a marketing class. And he said, I can't believe how relatable this is to a situation I'm having at work right now and how better equipped I feel to go back to work um, next week. And that's literally one and a half days into the program the, um, you know, the brainwaves are firing on all cylinders and you're making connections. The case-based approach is incredibly practical, 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 that shouldn't have been so hard, and applicable in the immediate. And so that ROI begins um, right out of the gate. And so that's something I think is really important to note. Um, and as JD mentioned, looking at the Financial Times data um, over the course of three years and beyond, um, you continue to see uh, an ROI, a strong ROI in terms of um, salary as well. With that, I would love to open the floor to questions. You'll notice that there is a Q&A function within the, um, within the webinar. So I invite you to, um, to add that in. I'll, um, well, and we can take turns, JD, Christine, and myself, um, answering your questions. If you have to chime out um, to completely understand, thank you for taking the time uh, for, to join us today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, my job is to help, my job is to support your research, answer your questions, and I strongly encourage you to be in touch at any time. I'm realizing a flaw of my own when putting this deck together is that I didn't include my email address. So what I will do is put it in the chat here and invite everyone and anyone to reach out if you are interested to learn more. Um, this really is an incredible opportunity I hope that you're feeling uh, both energized and supported following listening to what we've had to say and, um, and invite your questions now. So thank you so much. And like I said, I'll put my email address in the, in the chat. So Kim, I can knock off a few of them here. Sure. So just because I was looking through it. So somebody sure. asked, what's the degree name conferred? What is written on the diploma? So in the executive MBA program, it is a full MBA degree. So Christine graduated from the full-time program. I graduated from the executive program. What hangs on our wall is the same degree. What's really important to note is that that is not a university decision. These degrees are regulated by the government. So there's a process where they come in and they deem it as equivalent. Again, the differences in the degrees is, is where you are stage in your career what you're looking to do. The full-time MBA is much more designed for career transitions, changing both industry and function. The executive MBA is more designed for you to stay in your industry and function and move to more senior level positions. But it is a full MBA degree that hangs on uh, your wall. Um, a lot of questions, Kim, and maybe you wanna, a lot of people about what, what qualifies as a not-for-profit uh, scholarship. And maybe you can talk, we have limited numbers, but there's an, actually an application process that people go through. And that will cover a bunch of them. So I don't know if you can touch on that. Absolutely. So with respect to the not-for-profit scholarship, it is, as JD said, it is application-based. So once you submit your application, you'll be invited to apply. And it is available to individuals who are employed full-time by a registered charity or nonprofit organization. And you'll be invited to apply for it. The ap actual application will ask you questions related to the impact you're looking to have in your career, asking questions about your commitment to uh, philanthropy and volunteerism. There also will be um, questions about the, uh, how the program, um, how it aligns with your next steps. 
Uh, so we're really interested to hear, hear your response. And once you submit your application, um, it will be considered by the admissions committee. So Ivy's executive MBA uh, program has an admissions committee that not only makes the decisions related to joining the program. So if you're admitted, it's because of a decision from the admissions committee. They are also um, the body that reviews the applications for the not-for-profit scholarship. So somebody asked a question about transfer credits. Um, so we do not accept transfer credits into our program. We're a cohort-based program, which means we start from the beginning. Everyone starts from the beginning to the end. So there's not the opportunity for, you know, I took some courses here and I want to transfer them into your program. It doesn't work that way. It's not like when I did my undergrad, you know, you got 20 courses and once you got your 20 courses, you get the degree. It's designed as a program from beginning to end. It's actually no different than any other professional schools. It is, you know, I, um, MBA programs, dental schools, medical schools, law schools, they're very much uh, don't look at transfer credits um, as you would in your undergraduate uh, degree. And I wanted to correct a mistake that I put in the chat and I apologize for that. Um, the loans are actually lines of credit. So thank you, JD, for clarifying. You do need to make sure that these are deemed as the student loan designation uh, or the lines of credit. Um, otherwise, so if you were to take the money out of your house, for instance, using a HELOC, that the interest on that wouldn't be seen as a student loan interest. Um, and so speaking personally, I had a student line of credit and then I didn't have enough money. Uh, so I ended up getting a, a second line of credit and only the line of credit for the first loan um, was deductible on my taxes other loans or lines of credit are not. So I apologize for the for the misstep it, um, in calling it a loan, but just to be just make sure it's under the right umbrella. Yeah, Thanks, that's JD. A good point. Somebody had asked about um, somebody had asked a question about uh, that just came through on government grants. So I'll touch that on. Uh, I, I am not aware. Most of the government grants people uh, consider are things like OSAP, um, where there's a government grant opportunities. For the executive MBA, they will not qualify for OSAP, not qualify for government grants. And, I, and I'll give you the reason why. One is for many people, they are making, you know, the income threshold that they make is too high to qualify for them. Also that the program is designed that you can earn an income while doing it. So the, that's, that's long and short, the reason behind that. I saw there were a couple of questions I'll hopefully just rapid fire respond to. One was related to the, the GMAT um, and if it's required, we do offer a number of GMAT exemptions and I would be happy to do a preliminary profile assessment with anybody who would like to understand if you do qualify for a GMAT exemption. Um, so you're welcome to share your LinkedIn profile or your resume with me. I would encourage you to do so. Um, there was another question about the minimum grade. And so the ultimately, you need to receive uh, or earn a minimum of 60% in each course, and then an average of 70% across the term in order to progress to the, the next term. So minimum of 60% per course, and then average of 70%. And we grade out of 100%. So if you are um, in accounting, um, managerial accounting and control, for example, um, and your grade will be out of 100%, very consistently across the board, about a third of each grade is, um, is assigned based on your contributions. So note that I didn't say participation. We're looking for meaningful contributions uh, to the learning of your peers and to the discussion um, related to the business cases. A third will be related to individual assignments, and then a third uh, to group projects. Um, it's a very collaborative program where you will be working with your learning team quite closely. And so that comprises about a third of your grade in each course. Um, and then, I, let's see. Let's see. In terms of applying for a line of credit before applying, that was a question asked. Um, you're certainly, well, I would start I would start doing your research and connecting with the contacts that we've noted from the banks um, to start the conversation. In order to actually receive it though, you will need a confirmation of enrollment letter, which we will provide to you. So in order to actually like 
get the final seal and to receive the funds, you need a confirmation of enrollment. Um, once you have gone through the application process, received your offer of admission and accepted your offer, that's when we can provide that to you. Um, and we're happy to do so, but that will be a required step in order to uh, secure the funding for the, uh, the loans. Somebody was uh, looking for, sorry, Kim, because I deleted it by mistake. So I wanna cover it before I, <laughs> I put the answer live and I deleted it. So I think I know Zoom now after two years of doing this, but um, so somebody had asked a question about starting in September and it was specific around the RSP and access to it. So if you start in September, you would get the $10,000 RSP because you would get it because you're starting class in September. So you would get that in September, 2022. You would get a $10,000 RSP in 2023 because you're going to school in 2023. But also we have a one month of the program in, uh, in 2024 because the program ends in January. So you would actually, if you start in September, you could get $30,000 in your RSP because it spans over three calendar years. If you start in February, you can get 20,000 because it spans two calendar years. So that is a benefit if you're thinking of September and looking to maximize the RSP portion. So hopefully that answers your question because I, I apologize, I was gonna type an answer and then uh, I deleted it by mistake, so. I also see a question, um, major things to keep in mind while submitting an application to really stand out. Um, so not having project management experience, but having good experience um, leading, would the application be considered? Um, that's a really great question. And so to kind of, as, at a large scale, we are looking for a bare minimum of eight years experience. Although on average, very consistently, we see that participants have about 15 and a half years of professional experience, um, some who have 20 plus years joining the program. What we're really interested in um, is your ability to demonstrate leadership experience and management experience. So the project management experience, if you um, are lacking a project management experience, but you have a lot of people leadership experience, um, we'd certainly be interested to hear about that. And what I would encourage you to punctuate in your application is the impact that you've had within your organization. Um, or within the roles that you've held. The admissions committee is always keen to understand the progress you've made. Um, and so if you've made um, advancements in your career over the, the eight plus years or the 20 plus years, certainly interested to understand what that looks like. And in situations where you maybe have been in a role and the title has stayed the same for a number of years, but the scope of responsibility has changed, there are opportunities through the admission essays to highlight that. There are also opportunities through your admissions interview, which take place over the phone, um, to highlight that. So don't be shy. I always think of interviews, um, it's really your chance to brag. If not, you're the only one that could do that for you in that situation. So um, you know, don't be shy to share the, the impact that you've had in your, in your role, in your organization. Um, and there's also opportunity, um, recognize that, you know, Applicants to this program are incredibly dynamic, multidimensional. You may have two solid examples in your career that you'd like to touch on and a third personal um, ad, uh, accolade that you'd like to share. We're certainly, we recognize, um, we recognize the whole person, we value the whole person and what you can bring to the program. Um, so don't be shy to share that as well. Another question on the RSP is somebody's asking when you received your offer letter that does that impact it, it's not got nothing to do with when you receive your offer letter, it's when the class is actually, so the start of the program and the end of the program. So it has nothing to do with the uh, offer letter. Uh, there's a quick question in there about if somebody is from London and, and I can address this is because uh, I lived in London, I lived about 500 meters away from Spencer where the resident, so you get credits if you're in London and aren't using uh, Spencer for accommodation? And the answer is no. And I will tell you why it's important for you to stay even at Spencer. So because it's an important part with the classroom, also you need a place to put your stuff and everything else. So there's no credits on it. I would say in the time that I did the program, the three resident sessions, the first one I stayed there all the time. Second one, I went home one night and the third one, I went home one night, but it's important for the social aspect. 
because everyone's where, there that, uh, that to make the decision. And I can tell you for the four or five people in each class from London, uh, they would completely agree as well, so. Thanks, JD. I see a question here. Is the EMBA a good fit for young managers looking to augment their leadership to step forward? Absolutely. The program is designed for individuals who are looking to accelerate in their function or in their industry. And what I think is really exciting um, and kind of where the magic happens is that there is such diversity, not only of industry experience in the classroom, but also the participants in the program are at different junctures in their leadership journey. Um, so there are individuals who are on the, the younger side of their management journey. They may be looking to move into that director or VP role. We also have CEOs who join the program who recognize that their, their organization is moving in a new direction in the years to come, and they want to be really well positioned to drive that change um, in, a, in a positive and sustainable way. And so there are there's such diversity in the classroom. Um, and that really lends itself to an exciting and enriching learning experience. So absolutely, um, don't be deterred if you're on the younger side um, or the leaner side of experience. And I'd be happy to speak with you um, about your experience and how it aligns with what the admissions committee is looking for. Um, Don asked the question if in-person classes are recorded. The answer is no. Um, we really believe in, uh, I mentioned already that participation is a big component of your grade and the experience. Um, we want people to uh, safely share their experiences, their challenges, their solutions. Um, there have been instances where competing organizations have been in the same room. We don't record anything um, and we maintain a lot of confidentiality in terms of what is shared. So it really is an enriched, safe learning space um, and they are not recorded. And then another great question about an undergraduate degree and if it's required to be accepted, uh, the answer is no. The executive MBA program, um, the admissions committee, as I mentioned before, is really interested in understanding the management and leadership experience that you have accumulated and that you've earned throughout your career. So if you do not have an undergraduate degree, uh, the admissions committee will place additional weight on understanding um, the impact that you've had in your career to date. So if you don't have an undergraduate degree, um, please don't let that be a deterrent from continuing the conversation and exploring the program uh, because it is not a firm requirement. And I, I think I could, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Christine, sorry. I was gonna jump in because I was in the position of selecting between different organizations. There's an abstract question, why, why Ivy versus U of T or York? And I think that is actually something you really want to consider um, because when you're, when you're choosing an institution, you're also choosing a network. And if, if the networking is important to you, it's not for everyone, but if the network is important to you, you want to make sure that the network comprises of people that you want to be networking with. I know that sounds, it sounds obvious, but it's, it's kind of different. You know, if, if your network is in banking and consulting, that would differ than if you wanted a network that was strong in biotech or something else. So you want to look at what the school offers and make sure that that aligns with where you want to go in terms of who's in that network and who uh, comprises that network. One of the things that's really great about Ivy and that I can speak firsthand to is that the network is very active. It is very um, engaged and very outgoing. I think partly you sort of self-select by having this participation criteria and again it's I'm glad that they've changed it from just speaking to meaningful contribution but when you have that sort of uh, um, criteria for the classroom engagement it sort of people sort of self-select into the type of individuals who are participatory and that just lends itself to the experience after graduation so it, it, it's about fit for you, but I, as an alumni, I've had a really great experience with the network at Ivy. I hope that helps. I, I, I'm gonna add something and give you some advice because what people do is they consider an executive MBA as they, they sort of branch out and they, they look at you know, a bunch of programs and they're gonna come up with a short list, right? Schedule, curriculum, whatever that short list is. Once you come to that short list, the best thing you can do is to come and sit in an actual class of any school you're considering. 
And that gives you a sense of how the learning is done in the classroom. So we aren't a lecture-based program. We're very much an engaging discussion-based, as Kim mentioned. You wanna make sure that fits your learning style. You get a sense of who's in the classroom with you. You get a sense of the interaction between the faculty and the students. And to me, that's the best thing you can do. You get a sense of the culture. And so uh, I think that is uh, the, probably the best thing that you can do once you come with that short list. So to answer your question, what the differences are, the best way to do it is go and attend a classroom and you'll see what those differences are. And what you wanna do is you wanna walk out of any classroom visit, whether it's Ivy or another school and you wanna walk out and go, this is a place where I feel like I can thrive in. And this is a place that I feel like is the right fit for me. And the best way to do it is to come in and sit in a class. If you're interested to join us for a class, I can't st like um, stress enough that JD's dead on. Come visit us, sit in on a class, see for yourself. Um, please reach out to me if this is of interest. I would be pleased to share some dates and times and you can choose if you wanna come to um, a marketing class or a global strategy, uh, you name it. Um, you have choice uh, to see um, which class you'd like to join and participate in. And we'll actually prepare you with the case well, we won't prepare you, we'll provide the case. Uh, it'll be on you to prepare, um, but you can truly engage in the class and uh, see what it's like firsthand uh, to be an IV participant. And one last question, Kim, I think we've covered all of them, but I think this one, and if, if we miss some, then just reach out to, to us as well. But somebody's asking about academic distinctions in the program. So I can answer that is, so the person that finishes with the top overall average, we do this across all our prog programs, they're called a gold medalist. So they're recognized that way. In the executive MBA, the top 10% of the class with the top 10% overall average, uh, they uh, are deemed as IB scholars, so they graduate with distinction. So that just covers that question, so. Well, I think that wraps up our questions and I see we're, we're over the, the time, um, but that's, that's great. It means there, you know, you have lots of great questions, um, but I'm sure you have very busy days to get back to. Um, so I'll just end by thanking Christine and JD for joining me for this event. Um, your insights have been invaluable. And also thanks each of you for joining this presentation. I hope that you found uh, the information informative and that you are keen to continue uh, your research about the Ivy Executive MBA, please don't hesitate to reach out. I've dropped my email in the chat. I'll leave it again uh, before we sign off, but it's krandall at ivy.ca. And I look forward to connecting with each of you soon. So thanks again and have a great afternoon, everybody.